Welcome everybody. Today I'm going to talk about a certain type of attack against cryptocurrencies, the 51% attack. Rather than making money by stealing the private keys of a particular owner of cryptocurrency, this attack undermines the integrity of the currency itself. My name is Mark Nesbitt. I'm an engineer at Coinbase, a digital currency wallet and platform where merchants and consumers can transact with new digital currencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum. The focus of my work is something we call blockchain security. This is security support for systems that integrate with cryptocurrency networks and security assessments and mitigations for supported digital assets. Blockchain security is a part of the AppSec team at Coinbase. You can think of it as traditional AppSec applied to the domain of blockchains. The title of this talk is Hacking Cryptocurrencies. The first part is a deeper look at what I mean when I say hack. The second is an examination of 51% attacks, walking through real world examples and pointing out patterns we've observed. What do I mean by hack? With every new technology, a new exploit vector is born. New processor developments such as speculative execution or out of order execution were exciting boost to processor speed and also enabled the famous Spectre and Meltdown vulnerabilities. Blockchains are no different. They represent a new technology, which means there are now new ways to hack. Most everyone here is likely familiar with the CIA framework for security. C for confidentiality, I for integrity, A for availability. Examining a system for these three properties gives a great start into understanding the security and threats against a system. I'll describe how 51% attacks work in a bit more detail, but for the time being, it's important to realize that a cryptocurrency is a network of nodes that communicate to one another according to a protocol. The nodes on the network store a copy of the blockchain, which is a public shared database, and the network protocol allows nodes to communicate state information about the blockchain. Nearly every, every blockchain has an authorization model based on public key cryptography. The state of data in the blockchain can usually only be updated when the proper digital signature is provided. An example of this would be sending bitcoins from one person to another. The sender must authorize the state change by signing this send transaction with the appropriate private key. A wallet is a term for software that holds these private keys and performs this interaction with the blockchain. This means that wallets are separate systems built on top of blockchains. As you can realize, because the blockchain is a shared public database, Anyone can choose to build a wallet application on top of a blockchain, so there are a wide variety of wallets. When you hear about cryptocurrency attacks, you're usually hearing about wallet hacks. As I said before, this talk is about attacking the cryptocurrency itself, meaning that it's not about wallet hacks. To help show that distinction, I'll briefly use the CIA framework to examine wallet security before applying that to the blockchain itself. Confidentiality. Specifically, confidentiality of private keys. As I said, the keys authorize transactions on the blockchain, so if the private keys are leaked, anyone can authorize transactions for actions controlled by those keys. Integrity. In addition to holding private keys, wallets also create the transactions themselves before signing them. If an attacker can manipulate the transaction prior to signing, for instance, by substituting their own address instead of the original recipient, there's no need for the attacker to have access to the private keys. Confidentiality and integrity are two critical components of a secure wallet. A large part of my day-to-day -day work is ensuring confidentiality and integrity in Coinbase's wallet systems. Much of this is traditional security architecture and back-end security engineering work. Availability failures also happen in wallets, which typically result in a permanent destruction of the funds in the wallet. Since an attacker doesn't gain access to these funds, availability failures are not as prominent attack vectors. There are other failures for wallets as well, for instance, ensuring authorization to send funds, but none of these represent a new way to hack. Most services have secrets that need to be protected. So as I said, this talk is not about wallets. It's about the cryptocurrency itself, a new way to hack. Let's see where the CIA framework can get us there. Confidentiality. I define the blockchain as a shared database. Thus, it's entirely transparent, and there essentially is no confidentiality. Jumping to availability. This is a concern primarily for the developers of a cryptocurrency. Most integrations with a cryptocurrency use software created by the designers called nodes. Concerns about the availability of blockchains have driven much of what's known as the scaling debate. A protocol design that makes resources required to run a network node too expensive may impact the availability of the blockchain, which is information that everyone needs to participate in the network. Integrity. 
Violating the integrity of a blockchain is the focus of this talk. This represents a new way to hack. 51% attacks violate a blockchain's integrity in a very clever way that takes advantage of how a cryptocurrency network maintains consensus on the state of the blockchain. As I mentioned before, I work for Coinbase, a major cryptocurrency exchange. Exchanges make an ideal target for all kinds of attacks, including and especially 51% attacks. Exchanges hold a lot of cryptocurrency on behalf of their customers. That's an obvious enough reason for them to be good targets. But beyond simply being where the money is, there are other things that are attractive to an attacker. Liquidity and volume. Most cryptocurrency exchanges allow trading between different types of cryptocurrency. Being able to trade one currency into a different cryptocurrency can be very advantageous, as I'll explain when I break down 51% attacks. Speed. Exchanges often credit funds to customers on a relatively short time frame and allow for nearly instant sends. An attack can therefore happen very quickly. The ability to get in and out quickly is obviously a good thing for an attacker. Remote interaction. An attacker can execute this attack from anywhere, perhaps even North Korea. And in some cases, anonymity. I want to take a second to talk about this. Many popular media descriptions of cryptocurrency seem to ascribe it with a quasi-magical anonymity, which it doesn't have. This is especially true if you have an authenticated session with an exchange such as Coinbase. Coinbase strives to be the most trusted exchange in the entire cryptocurrency industry. As part of that, we're heavily regulated, and part of that regulation involves, going, involves the lengths we go to ensure that every customer on our platform has gone through a rigorous KYC AML process. KYC stands for Know Your Customer, so that means knowing their identities, and that is important for AML, anti-money laundering. Any exchange that doesn't follow these strict requirements would obviously be more attractive to potential attackers. So if you can find some sort of vulnerability, whether that's subverting a protocol or a more traditional wallet-style vulnerability, as I described earlier, an exchange makes for a great target. This requires exchanges to have security as a top priority. It requires us to prioritize resources towards security and take the utmost care in how we write our software. It also requires us to have deep expertise in the cryptocurrency systems that we're integrating with so we can predict, detect, and respond to any events that occur in systems we rely on, even if they're out of control, out of our control, such as the blockchains themselves. This is why we have a blockchain security effort at Coinbase. Now I'll describe how a 51% double spend attack works. 51% attacks take advantage of how a cryptocurrency network maintains consensus on the state of the blockchain. So we're going to have to dive into how that works. As I mentioned before, a blockchain is a shared database stored by all nodes on the network and accessible to anyone. For this database to be useful, there must be a way to update it. Blockchains are append-only databases and are updated in batches of transactions. Each batch of transactions that are added to the blockchain is typically called a block. So we could visualize the blockchain as shown here. And we can expect that a block n plus 1 would shortly be added. But who defines block n plus 1? How do we determine its contents? The blockchain is a shared distributed database, so this isn't obvious. Regardless of what the mechanism is, however, there must be some way of reaching consensus among the network participants about what constitutes the block. The answer for who defines the block is that it depends on the cryptocurrency. This is one of the major defining characteristics of cryptocurrencies, and a lot of newer cryptocurrencies have innovative methods for adding to the blockchain. We're going to review some high-profile examples. There are several approaches, as I mentioned, this talk will be focusing on one called proof of work, but here are some others you may have heard of. If you've heard of the cryptocurrencies Ripple and Stellar, there's a consensus protocol that involves validator nodes that vote on the contents of the next block. The cryptocurrency called EOS has regular elections where nodes are elected as block producers that take turns producing the block. Tezos and Cosmos are two examples of a proof of stake network where the node chosen is based on its stake, which is the proportion of network funds that it owns. And the node is chosen in a random lottery, and it defines the block. And lastly, proof of work, Bitcoin and Ethereum. The node that first successfully solves a cryptographic puzzle defines the block. This is known as proof of work. It's known as proof of work because the solution to this puzzle has to be brute forced, 
which takes considerable computational effort. This is called mining. Mining a block is when a node successfully discovers the solution to the proof of work puzzle. Here is a key fact about proof of work networks. Anyone can bring their computation to the table, and if they produce a valid block, they have extended the blockchain. If you can do the work, you can play the game. No permission required. This diagram shows the blockchain tilted 90 degrees from the previous diagram, with the blocks separated. Block n plus 1 will be added on top of the other blocks. As before, each block contains some number of transactions on the cryptocurrency network. The green arrow represents the canonical blockchain, that is, the version of the shared database that all network participants agree represents the blockchain. Ensuring that all nodes can agree on a canonical blockchain is obviously a crit critical component of a functioning network. Suppose some node solves the computationally intensive cryptographic puzzle I described before. It broadcasts that block to all, of its, all the other nodes that it's connected to on the network, and all the transactions in the block are considered to have been added to the canonical history of transactions on the network, that is, added to the blockchain. But suppose a second block is found simultaneously to this block. As I said, anyone bringing their computational power can participate. This second block may have been solved by another participant in the network, and it almost certainly contains different transactions than the first, even if only the differences are small. How does the network decide which block contains the transactions that are to be added to the blockchain? The rule is that the nodes on the network define the series of blocks with the most work as the canonical history. Each block takes a considerable amount of work to produce, so if either of the two blocks gets another block extending on top of it, there will be more accumulated work on that branch, in this case, two to one. The fact that the branch on the left has more work makes it the canonical blockchain. The block on the right is ignored, and any transactions that are contained in it that aren't contained in one of the other recently found blocks are not considered to be part of the cryptocurrency's transaction history. This rule means that there's never a case where a block is truly finalized on the chain. If enough participants in the network decide to create blocks based on a certain block that may not be the most recent block in the chain, if enough of them are doing this, they will eventually produce a branch with more accumulated work than the rest of the chain. At this point, those new blocks will be considered the canonical history based on this, this network rule. So this situation shows that case. It's called a reorg, short for reorganization, because the network consensus on which blocks constitute the blockchain has changed. The grayed out blocks on the left are known as orphaned blocks. This brings us to the concept of 51% attacks. Let me repeat a key fact from that previous slide. Any actor that can outwork the rest of the network combined is the sole arbiter of, among, of, of which among all possible valid blocks are the ones that are actually added to the canonical history. This is because of the fact that they can outwork the rest of the network and it allows them to choose which blocks they want to orphan and reorganize out of the blockchain. They are able to do this because they have 51% or more of network mining power, which is why it's called a 51% attack. So if there were some kind of network instability where blocks were not always immediately shared with the network after they were found, or if some actor was deliberately holding back blocks that had been discovered, we could see something where these blocks on the left are hidden from the network. But if they were shared with the network, the network would switch over to these blocks as the canonical history of transactions, orphaning the blocks that were previously the most recent additions to the chain. Because of this potential for instability of the most recent blocks, anyone receiving a transaction should wait for several blocks to be found until after the block that contained the transaction, thereby lowering the chances that the block that contained their transaction will be orphaned. An analogy I found interesting is that the most recent blocks are like recently fallen leaves in the fall. They can blow around and change and shift, after a while, they might get waterlogged and don't move nearly as much. Eventually, they'll decompose into mud, and after long enough, they could become rock. Any party that receives transactions can adjust their own risk by having their transactions, uh, their own risk of the transactions being removed from the history due to a reorg by adjusting the number of blocks that they wait. How deep do you want your transaction buried until they credit the deposit to the user? This is known as the confirmation requirement and each recipient of a transaction determines their own confirmation requirement. So imagine we had the following situation. Coinbase supports a fictional coin, MuCoin, M-U-H. Suppose the confirmation requirement for M-U-H is three blocks. That means Coinbase will credit a deposit after three blocks have been found 
that three blocks after the transaction that was the deposit. Also suppose that Coinbase supports Bitcoin MUH trading. Any customer of Coinbase could have the following intention. Create a transaction T that sends coins from the customer's address, A1, to Coinbase, to the customer's account. Wait for three blocks, after which the confirmation limit is reached, and Coinbase will consider the deposit finalized. Remember, Coinbase gets to choose this level of risk, and we've assumed that, we're, uh, th that Coinbase has set this value to be three in the case of MUH. Coinbase will then credit the funds that were in transaction T to the customer's Coinbase account. The customer could then sell that MUH for Bitcoin, and then they could send that Bitcoin wherever they like. This is a completely normal pattern of, of behavior for a customer to take, essentially exchanging their MUH for BTC. Let's imagine, however, that this customer is actually an attacker, an attacker with the ability to outwork the entire rest of the MUH network, 51% of the mining power. The attacker would create transaction T, sending some amount of MUH to their Coinbase account. Suppose T is quickly included in a block by some miner on the network, as shown here. Simultaneously, the attacker will create T prime, a second transaction. Let's take a closer look at T and T prime. Addresses with an A are attacker controlled, and address C is controlled by Coinbase. The attacker has funds in address A1. In transaction T, which is the public transaction that everyone can see, the attacker sends these funds to their Coinbase account, A1 to C. A few more blocks are mined eventually, and then Coinbase would credit these funds to the attacker's Coinbase account. In transaction T prime, the attacker sends those same funds in address A1 to another address that is attacker controlled, A2. T and T prime cannot exist in the same transaction history since they both consume the funds at address A1. As soon as one of these transactions is accepted as valid, the network will consider the other to be invalid. The term for that is that T and T prime are double spends of one another, same money being spent twice. But either transaction on its own is perfectly valid. The public blockchain includes version T, where the funds are sent to Coinbase, but the secret blockchain that the attacker is building contains T prime, where the funds never leave the attacker's control. So the attacker is building an, an alternative blockchain in secret. The public blockchain is the version that all network participants, including Coinbase, are able to observe. Crucially, in this secret history, there is no deposit of the funds in address A1 to Coinbase. So the attacker begins to mine the secret blockchain, including T prime. The space on the right with the gray background is local to the attacker, where the network cannot observe. And remember that we've assumed the, the attacker can outwork the rest of the network, meaning the attacker can produce blocks faster than the rest of the network. From the perspective of the network, nothing out of the ordinary is happening. Coinbase sees that a customer has deposited funds to their account. However, they won't be credited until there are three confirmations due to that three confirmation MUH requirement. The attacker does not sit idly by while waiting for these confirmations and continues to secretly produce blocks. The network also produces blocks, but unknown to anyone is not keeping up with the attacker. Eventually, the network will produce enough blocks that the confirmation requirement is reached, in this case, three. Coinbase can now credit the attacker's account with MUH. As we described before, suppose the attacker will sell it, sells it for Bitcoin, which can then be sent off the platform. So sold for Bitcoin, the Bitcoin is withdrawn. It's in the attacker's control. Remember, nothing publicly seen thus far is anything out of the ordinary, just a MUH to BTC trade. Now the attacker can execute the attack simply by revealing the secret blocks to the network. These blocks have more accumulated work than the existing top three blocks because there are four of them. Remember, the network considers the chain with the most work to be the canonical blockchain, so according to the network rules, a reorg will occur. The attacker's blocks now represent the canonical blockchain. The top three blocks that we'd previously seen publicly are now orphaned blocks. They're no longer part of the blockchain. The transactions defined in them are now no longer a part of the history. And notice the T was in, that, in those blocks, meaning there's no longer a transaction to Coinbase in the blockchain anymore. But the Bitcoin, as you can see, has still been withdrawn. There was a withdrawal without a deposit, a successful theft. Ability to do this is directly related to how difficult it is for an attacker to overpower the network. A key part of this was the assumption we made in the beginning, that the attacker was able to produce more blocks than the rest of the network combined. Thus, the more work being put into solving the proof of work puzzles on the network at large, the more difficult it is for any single attacker to overwhelm the rest of the network and pull this off. Note also that the danger of this attack comes when the target accepts a deposit directly from the attacker. 
In this example, Bitcoin was provided in exchange for MUH. If the attacker can't get something irrevocable in exchange for the vulnerable coin, the attack is inviable. This is one of the reasons that an exchange is such a great target for this attack, liquidity in cryptocurrencies. Fifty-one percent attacks are easy to observe if you're watching for them. Each block is identified by a unique hash, which is a unique fingerprint for the block. If the hash of a block at any particular height changes from what it was before, it means it's a different block, which means there must have been some kind of reorg. Small events, small shallow depth reorgs happen on a regular basis. This is primarily driven by the fact that many nodes are simultaneously attempting to find blocks, and there is some amount of latency within the network. So there will be race conditions where multiple blocks are found at the same time, but eventually only one will be built on by other miners and be part of the canonical blockchain. Examining the hash, that is the fingerprint, of the blocks at height n minus 1, n minus 2, etc., can give an understanding of how deep or severe a reorg was. Any reorg with a depth greater than the recipient's confirmation limit confirmation requirement is a situation where an effective double spend is possible. Remember, two transactions are double spends if they both spend the same money but to different places. They couldn't exist in the chain together, but they might exist in competing branches of the chain. That's the smoking gun that a reorg was malicious. Money that was sent to one place originally is effectively clawed back during the reorg. Let's summarize what an attacker would need to execute this attack. Remember, the attack is similar to bouncing a check. You send money to someone, they give you something in exchange, but then the original money is never actually theirs. The attack has two components. One, the ability to form a secret chain, which requires majority mining power. That is the ability to overwhelm the rest of the network's mining power. In the check bouncing analogy, this is what gives someone the ability to actually write a check that's invalid. You could think of it as having physical possession of the check from a real account at a real bank. You can't bounce a check without that. Two, the ability to create transactions T and T prime. The attacker will need some of the currency itself to do this. And the more coins the attacker has, the bigger impact of the double spend T and T prime. In the check bouncing analogy, this is like writing a really large check. The attacker also needs to select a victim. Obviously, the victim must accept the cryptocurrency. In the check bouncing analogy, the victim obviously has to allow the attacker to pay by check. But the victim also has to provide something of value that they cannot take back once they realize they've been scammed. With the check, this would be like cashing the check. The attacker gets cold hard cash and disappears with it. There wouldn't be much point to bouncing a check on something like the down payment of a house. This means that an attacker couldn't sell the cryptocurrency for US dollars and transfer those to a bank account. Not only is that likely to expose the attacker's identity, but the bank transfer can typically be reversed. Cryptocurrencies that aren't vulnerable to 51% attacks that is, ones that have enough mining power, however, can't be reversed. That's why cryptocurrency exchanges make such good targets for 51% attacks. Also notice something here, that this attack can be repeated indefinitely until the victim takes defensive action, either by raising the confirmation requirement for the coin or, or just simply ceasing interaction with that currency. Real world examples. We're going to talk about three different examples of this happening. BTG is Bitcoin Gold, VTC is a currency called Vertcoin, and ETC is a cryptocurrency called Ethereum Classic. Bitcoin Gold was the first major one and put us on alert. Coinbase did not support Bitcoin Gold at the time and, and does not support Bitcoin Gold today, but we knew about it. Um, everyone knew that 51% attacks were a theoretical possibility from the beginning, but this was the first time it actually happened. This caused us to invest in the ability to monitor for these and alert if they happened. The VTC, vert coin attack, <clears throat> also is a coin that Coinbase doesn't support, but we were able to monitor it and prove our ability. Excuse me. <coughs> Ethereum Classic is a coin that is supported on Coinbase, and we observed this attack firsthand with our monitoring tool. We're going to dive into the Ethereum Classic attack. This was a year ago in January. Um, so we're going to break down the different steps here. The Ethereum Classic network is minding its own business, mine, mining blocks as usual, adding transactions to the blockchain. And then all of a sudden, seven new blocks show up out of nowhere. And these seven blocks don't extend from the most recent block, but they dig five blocks down. 
up orphaning four blocks. It's very unusual for a miner not to extend from the highest block. So this type of reorg is unusual. 12 hours later, it happened again. Six new blocks orphaned five previously discovered blocks. I called both of these uh, incidents tr practice attacks because neither contain that double spend pair of transactions, T and T prime, where the same money gets spent to different recipients and different branches of the reorg. These incidents were just reorgs, not double spends. We had observed reorgs, we had never observed reorgs of this depth on ETC, but it would be premature to label these as attacks just on their own, since they were not double, there were no double spends. However, three hours later, there was another reorg. 74 blocks showed up all at once, orphaning 57 blocks. In addition, a T and T prime were present in the two branches. As before, the attacker had funds in A1, address A1. In the public transaction T, they transferred those funds to the victim V, probably in exchange. In T prime, they transferred those funds to another tracker controlled address A2. This was on a Saturday night. Our monitoring system alerted, our on-call engineers responded, validated the alert, and disabled Ethereum Classic functionality on Coinbase temporarily. This protected Coinbase from the subsequent 21 reorgs that occurred during this attack. It protected us because we weren't crediting any deposits in Ethereum Classic. Remember, the one, one of the things required for this attack to succeed is the victim to provide something irrevocable to the attacker in exchange for the deposit of the vulnerable currency. Since we disabled Ethereum Classic, we weren't crediting any deposit, deposits, so we couldn't be attacked. Here are the details of the transactions for anyone who wants to review the slides later. These two transactions have the same sending address and the same nonce, which is a required field for Ethereum Classic transactions to determine their order, but they're to a different recipient. That's what makes them double spends. We'll talk about observed patterns. Blockchains are public. This means that a 51% attack is a very noisy attack and leaves all kinds of good data for understanding the attackers. I'm gonna walk through just a few of the things that we've observed, but they really only scratch the surface of what we could probably learn about an attacker. These attacks leave such a trail behind them that I think it won't be long before we learn quite a lot about these attackers and we're good at following this evidence. This chart shows all the 17 reorgs that we were able to find when we researched the Bitcoin gold attack and how much Bitcoin gold was taken in each one. Notice the first two, nothing was taken. There was no T and T prime, but there was a reorg. Same story with the first five attacks in Vertcoin and the first two in Ethereum Classic. Remember what I said, the attack has two parts, building the secret chain and creating T and T prime. So what did the attackers do? They broke the problem down into two steps and made sure they could build an attack chain before they worried about creating T and T prime. Criminals are also not perfect. These are the same three charts as before. And you may have noticed that there were some gaps. These are a lot harder to explain. But as far as I can tell, it looks like the attackers did a bunch of work to reorg the chain without putting in double spend transactions TNT prime. They didn't get anything for it. For the first few reorgs, it makes sense to assume that they were testing their ability to reorg the chain. But once they've proven they can done that, this just looks like mistakes to me. If you imagine yourself in the attacker's shoes, you have an interesting dilemma. Once you have the hash power to successfully attack the network, any additional resources you have should be directed towards owning more of the currency itself to make T and T prime bigger transactions so that you can get more in exchange when you double spend them. In other words, the cost of the reorg and the payoff of the reorg are not functions of one another. So as an attack progresses, an attacker starts to accumulate resources, successfully stealing from an exchange. Should these resources be reinvested or just taken off the table? In the Bitcoin gold attack and most of the Vertcoin attack, attackers were mostly in exploit mode. They have X coins and every time they perform a double spend, they'll get X payoff and they repeat that as many times as they can. But in the Ethereum classic attack and oddly in the first three Vertcoin attacks, reorgs, the attackers were in invest mode this makes me think that in the, the Ethereum classic attackers may have been planning to continue attacking because I would expect the optimal attack profile to, to conclude with a period of exploit rather than invest. It's also worth pointing out something interesting about the Ethereum classic data. It steps up in pairs. 
The first double spend was for a tiny amount at number three, also probably a test. You can see four and five are of similar size, but then the size roughly doubled to six, for six and seven, roughly doubled again for eight and nine, stepped up again significantly for 10 and 12, 11 looks like a mistake again, and it doubled again for 13 and 15, with 14 being another mistake. It seems that the attacker was balancing, investing, and exploiting. Bigger and bigger payoffs each time, but prepared to stop at a moment's notice, so also taking, off, taking money off the table each step. I think this is pretty clever. And All right, other patterns. High profitability. This is just the returns from the double spends alone of each of these three attacks. When attackers create a reorg, it means they're mining blocks, which means there's also a mining reward that they could sell. These figures don't even include that. So this is simply the cost to mine versus the amount that was double spent. Very effective, a lot of margin for error. But the mining reward and leftover coins are valuable and do typically get sold. They are sent almost immediately after the attacks. Timing. Analyzing the time of the day of these attacks is another route to understanding the attackers. I mapped the times of the attacks on this slide. It's hard to draw meaningful conclusions from Bitcoin Gold and Vertcoin, the top two. There does seem to be some clustering, but it's not too dramatic, and there seems to be pretty much 24-hour coverage. That's not true about Ethereum Classic on the bottom, as you can see. There's obviously a major pattern in the time of day. And it's interesting to note the one outlier to that was one of the practice attacks that I described before, so it's already a different case. When I see this type of pattern, I have two major hypotheses about what could be driving it. The attacker's preferred waking hours or the time zone the attacker considers most damaging to the victim, probably at night. Also, note that the Ethereum Classic attacks and most of the Vertcoin attacks happened over the weekends, again, probably because that is when it's most difficult for an exchange to respond. When doing timing analysis, it's important to note that these attacks can sometimes take hours for the attacker to build the secret chain, meaning the attacker doesn't have full luxury of choosing their moment and may be forced to work around the clock. As an example, the longest Bitcoin gold attack chain was 27 blocks, which would have taken them over four hours to create, and the longest vertcoin attack chain was 310 blocks, which would have taken over 12 hours to create. As I said earlier, the risk for 51% attacks is in directly accepting money from an attacker. An attacker will therefore want to find an exchange where it's possible to hide their identity from the exchange. I talked about KYC and AML. This is one of the things that Coinbase does, and it's one of the things that helps make us safer. An attacker wouldn't want to attack Coinbase because we would probably have more information about their identity than we would from another exchange that doesn't apply these same standards. Another pattern we've observed is that attacks stop after they're publicized. This makes sense because, because anyone being attacked has the ability to respond, and it makes the attack less effective. The blue lines show when the attacks stopped, basically immediately after publication in all three examples. The last observed pattern is suboptimal transaction placement. We're going to consider the example of the first Ethereum Classic double spend attack, where 74 blocks orphaned 57 blocks. The ideal block for the, the attacker to place transaction T is the deepest block that was orphaned, which would have given the transaction 57 confirmations. Remember, the, the attacker wants to get as many confirmations as possible, so it's like so, to maximize the chances that the exchange will credit the, or credit the transaction to their account. But in this case, <clears throat> T was placed 13 blocks higher, where it only had 44 confirmations at the time of the attack. That means the attacker did the amount of work required to orphan a transaction with 57 confirmations, but only for one that had 44. This happened in the vast majority of the double spends that we observed. Transaction T was placed in a suboptimal block. To summarize my talk today, I defined hacking by attacking the integrity of the blockchain. New technologies mean new ways to hack. I also explained why exchanges are a good target. Money, liquidity, speed, remote interaction, and in some cases, anonymity. 
I describe the mechanics of a 51% double spend attack where attackers are able to outwork the rest of the network by mining more than 50% of the blocks. I then walk through real world examples of the attacks on Bitcoin Gold, Vertcoin, and Ethereum Classic and discuss the patterns we've observed. That's it. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, I got a mic for you here. In these attacks, uh, good presentation, by the way. Thank you. Um, in these attacks, for each of the individual ones, are you seeing the, the same um, sender, or how many different, even in the trial in the uh, trial runs, are you seeing a different ID for the sender, or uh, uh, how many different ones? Yeah, they use different addresses often. It's sometimes with a lot of wallets, the actual address can be abstracted away. So I'm not sure that attackers are necessarily paying that much attention to whether they're using the same address or a different address, as long as it's within their wallet and it's managed by the wallet, it doesn't really matter. Um, but typically, it, it, it varies, but we've seen them, we've seen both. We've seen attacks where they use the same address, like that A1 was the same address in every attack. And then we've, in some of these attacks, we've also seen where it's been like A1, A2, A3, A4, and different addresses for each of the different reorgs. Can you tell that they're in the same, you can't tell that the multiple IDs are in the same wallet? You can't, but you can, you can infer in this case, if you're, they're part of you know, an attack, it's part of this pattern, and you can see that double spending is happening from these addresses, you can assume that it's all part of the same wallet, but you cannot link the addresses to, to one wallet. I guess that's what I'm thinking is like, if, if there was a double, if you, how, how do you know it's a double spend if the source, I guess it's from the same source, but... It's from the same source. That's how you know it's a, it's a okay. double spend where it's like, so it might've been address A5, but we saw it, we, a5 was part of a pair of transactions, where in one, one of the two transactions it was to you know, recipient X, and in the other it was to recipient Y. So, but it was from the same source. But then when you repeat that multiple times, it may or may not be the same address in each of the repetitions. So you used the analogy of uh, writing a uh, balance check and the such. Yeah. I didn't quite hear how on the double spend, how they're actually able to extract something of value at the end, whether they use the Bitcoin to purchase a hard product uh, <laughs> that's uh, able to be exchanged in, say, a barter situation, or uh, if they're able to convert the Bitcoin to some other uh, currency that's less liquid, uh, sure. regular currency. Yeah, that makes sense. I, uh, maybe that was an assumption on my part. I think of Bitcoin as a hard product. Um, but once they've taken the Bitcoin off of the exchange, the victim, they can, th that Bitcoin is essentially not associated with anything that they've done. The exchange sent it to some address, and then they clawed back their original you know, MUH or whatever. And then they can take that Bitcoin and send it to any exchange that allows them to exchange Bitcoin for something of value, whether that's another cryptocurrency, whether that's some kind of fiat currency like US dollars or pounds or euros or whatever. So that's, that's how they would truly exit cryptocurrency. If they wanted to like get, get it out of the entire cryptocurrency ecosystem, they would take that Bitcoin and sell it. Um, just wondering, what, where's the origin of most of these attacks? Is it mostly through wallets? Is that where it starts? And, and are there certain wallets, like based upon how they're built, be it you know, either in JavaScript or native languages that are more susceptible to allowing hackers to get in? Or um, So the hackers are not attacking wallets. They are attacking the integrity of the blockchain itself. So they're essentially rewriting history on the blockchain. So every wallet is built on top of the blockchain and all of a sudden the wallet is looking at the chain. It's like, oh, hey, look, I've got money at this address. That's cool. But then all of a sudden if a reorg is published and it's, it's counting on certain blocks that may have been rewritten, then the wallet will have to update its view of the world. So it's not through the wallet. But it, so the wallet's not their point of entry. They don't need to use a wallet. They could just access the blockchain Correct. They off would, the internet. Yes, that's right. And, and the, the point of entry, I guess, it would be a node that is a mining node. So they download the, the software that is... Um, and what's that written in? Uh, it, depend, it depends on the cryptocurrency. Okay. Are there any, any of those nodes that are more susceptible to hacking to, that you know, aren't able to defend themselves? Like, um, you know, is there any client-side defenses to these applications that would help in stopping these hackers being successful in accessing the nodes? 
There wouldn't be defenses because this is how the network functions. The network is designed to follow the chain with most work. So if you can produce that, you're, you're playing by the rules, and that is how the network will function. As far as differences between vulnerability, it's not the nodes that produce the vulnerability, but the actual mining power. So it, 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 it depends on each cryptocurrency. They all have a different amount of mining power behind them. And the ones that have less mean it takes less resources to overwhelm their mining power and rewrite history. So you just have to be a legitimate miner first off, and That's then right. you can have access. OK, That's interesting. Right. All right, thanks. So in order to perform a 51% attack, you need considerable hash power. That's right. Right? Yeah. And uh, there's also the value that you're going to get from that attack. Mm -hmm. So uh, is there any index that you could say, well, this currency is potentially uh, going to suffer a 51% attack given the value that you can get from reversing transactions given the um, hash power? Yeah, you can, you can run some, some math where you estimate how expensive it is to overwhelm the network. And then you would have to make a trade with somebody else in that currency that you could reverse. But the, what's, what's interesting, I mentioned this briefly, but there's no direct relationship between how difficult it is to overwhelm a network and how much money you can make. If a network only takes a few dollars to overwhelm, let's imagine an extreme case, but someone wants to accept a million dollar transaction on it, and then I can reverse it, I made a million dollars, right? It didn't matter how expensive it was to overwhelm the network. So it all sort of depends on what type of liquidity and markets you have supported in that currency. And if you can make these trades in that currency, but it's cheap to overwhelm that currency, then that would be one that's, that's right for attack. Hi, thanks for the good talk. As a defense for this, has Coinbase considered having a reserve of computing power to like if you sense a 51% attack happening, start mining to reduce the amount of um, processing power the attacker has and then sort of kind of reclaim the, um, the network? Yeah, that wouldn't be feasible for Coinbase because of the massive amount of computational power that that would require. You'd essentially have to have like an extremely powerful, you know, set of computers sitting on the sidelines doing nothing capable of responding extremely quickly. I think it's possible though for miners to, to do something like this. If you were an honest miner, you could try to reclaim that orphaned chain, right? Like the chain was orphaned, but maybe you decide to build back on it. But you would have to actually beat the attacker. You'd have to have more hash power than the attacker, which is a very difficult thing to do. So I, I, don't, I don't think that's very practical. You'd have to act quickly. You'd have, it would take a lot of resources. And it, the, the payoff for the, for the actual entity that's investing in doing that probably is not worth it. Do orphan transactions get that aren't double spins get put back on the network, or are they just gone forever? They get put back on the network. That's actually why it's important to create a T and a T prime. Because if you just orphan T, it is still potentially valid, and it could still be included in the future. And then the attacker never actually got rid of it, just delayed it. But if they create a T prime, that makes T forever invalid. And so it could never be included. Uh, the question is, is that because there's a retry? And it's, the answer is essentially yes. That T would be, it would be not in a block, but it would be sitting around in a queue pending, and any miner could choose to include it in a future block. So, but if you create a T prime, then, then T is, is now invalid, and it will never be included. Question back there? Yep. So a little off the top, a little off your direct focus top topic, but more to Coinbase. So you, earlier on, you mentioned Coinbase, um, we'll say, keeps track of the transactions or authenticates the, the people conducting those transactions in some way, shape, or form. Yes. Uh, so if I wanted to use Coinbase to uh, pay someone in cryptocurrency and actually know who that person is, is that something that I'm able to do? If, they, if they, we do the transactions in Coinbase to Coinbase? Yes, Coinbase to Coinbase... You can, you can send from one Coinbase account to another Coinbase account, and you would identify that account with the email address, so you could pay to like a known entity that way. Right. Do you find that you can use that in ransomware cases with, we'll say, less sophisticated ransomware actors? 
I don't know if there are any examples of that. That would be pretty, that, that would be like a really bad mistake for a ransomware actor to do that. I, I'd be surprised if they actually made that mistake. They, they probably have their own wallets, and maybe there's an example of someone doing something really stupid, but I, I would expect that ransomware actors have their own address, not associated with Coinbase whatsoever. That's what they use as their, as their address for all their uh, targets, and it really has nothing to do with Coinbase, and it's just the, uh, the cryptocurrency network itself that the money is flowing over. Um, do you have any idea, like approximately, like resource-wise, how much do these attackers spend? Or do, do they rent the mining equipment? Do they buy it? Or? Yeah, that's that's a good question. We we do we can estimate how much they spend, because in a lot of cases the cost to mine is approximately the same as the rewards to mine. Um, so the rewards to mine are, are visible in the chain because that that gets paid to miners. So you can estimate the cost with that amount. Um, so you can use that to kind of ballpark it. As far as where they get the computing power, uh, that's less certain. I, I think they probably can rent it, though. And do you include like the cost of electricity in these? Like, what yeah, if they hack yeah. these machines and no one actually pay for it? Right. It's it's mostly cost of electricity. I think. Any other questions? Sorry. Um, why did they put it in a suboptimal place when they replaced it? You said it's just a mistake, I, or I don't know. I think. I mean, it. It probably. I mean, it, it may have been a mistake. It may have been that they didn't need it in the most optimal place. I mean, you saw the profit margins were pretty high, so it's not like they need to run a, sp a particularly tight operation. So, if in this case it was it was like 57 blocks were orphaned but they only had 44 confirmations on the actual transaction. So maybe they were attacking an exchange that had a 40 confirmation requirement, and they were just not actually caring that much about getting it right. As long as it was done, it, it wasn't like that expensive additional cost. So. Any other questions? Yeah. I just keep thinking, are there heuristics you can apply to this? Like, talking about what you were just talking about, talking about where you see that T transaction that's somebody ex taking an address and exchanging money and, and sending it out of Coinbase mm -hmm. and then just saying, like, you're not going to allow transactions for a certain amount of time from that same address until later. Like, it, it doesn't have to be the same as the confirmation requirement. You could say when you there's a confirmation requirement for transactions in general, but if somebody has taken data out of the thing, there, there's a longer settling time that you could use to thwart the double spend? Right, yeah, no, you could theoretically have a, what we would call like a transaction specific confirmation requirement. Because right. right now the confirmation requirement applies to all transactions. But you could say, well, if the transaction's above a certain size, we're gonna have a longer requirement on it. Or if it's from an address that we somehow have identified as a potentially suspicious address, um, you could do things like that. The prob problem with that is, all of those heuristics are pretty easily gamed. Um, you could, you know, transaction T could actually be 10 transactions T that were all structured to be under our limit. Or if it's a, if we're identifying a blacklisted address, they could just route it through another address. So like there are a lot of um, ways of getting around that. Um, the, the easiest, the, the best thing to do is if, if you see an attack going on, you just raise your confirmation limit across the board very high and you kind of ride it out that way. And, and the, the consequence of that is just the affecting the user experience of anyone participating in that cryptocurrency, which I think is sort of the appropriate place for the pain to be felt because it's an issue with that cryptocurrency. So if you want to use that cryptocurrency, well, this is one of the, um, the, the, the things that we have to do to support it. Was you, there another question up here? I'm always I'm curious about proof of work especially for Bitcoin, because, you know, people talk about entire regions in China are used, all they do is they mine. But when I look at how people mine, they use ASIC processors and that kind of thing. Being from the chip world, we could put a million processors on a wafer. You, go, you see where I'm going with that? If you're a nation state or you're a chip company and you spend a 10 or $15 million, you can produce something that would be infinitely powerful for computing hash. Right. Yeah. And if you could do that, hypothetically, what would be the impact on how would you manipulate that or use that to manipulate the 51 percent in the process like in Coinbase? 
um, that at any time you wanted to, you could turn on the processor and compute as many to any level of computation that you wanted. What would that be like? Yeah, that would be an existential threat to the cryptocurrency, I think, it would be the right way to think about it. If a nation state were able to do that, I think, I think it's a little harder than you implied in the question because the chips are extremely efficient. So you're not probably going to build a significantly better chip than what exists right now. You would have to build more of them, and there are already quite a lot of them, well, and they're spread around the world. Look at it this way. You can, you can always do 10 to 100 times faster by a custom chip over an ASIC. The, the current Always. ones are, are custom already. But if you actually design a, a chip on a wafer, you design one processor and create a bus architecture and you put thousands of processors on a wafer, just thousands and thousands of them. And long years ago, decades ago, there's something called a transputer that worked like that. You had all these processors with a bus and you shared a processor and you did that kind of computation. Um, so I know from the chip world, you cannot, uh, uh, anything you do with ASICs is not even in the same ballpark of what you can do with custom chips. Okay, yeah, sure, we can, we can talk about it afterwards. I think, think what you're describing is currently the state of the art, but I'm happy to, to talk to you about okay. it Okay, I just wanted to know that, sure. actually. Yeah. Any final questions? Final question. One final question. Um, from an enforcement point of view, if there is a double spend, everything goes on the ledger. So is there any, you know, work to like track where that money goes, if it transfers wallets and, you know, different addresses? And if it ever converts from digital to physical, is there an opportunity to potentially go nab somebody? Yes, there absolutely is. The problem is there, it's just too leaky of an ecosystem. I think to, that you're, you're, you're going to plug all the holes. Like maybe if, if they tried to exit through Coinbase, like we could observe them. But if it's just some exchange that gets run by, you know, a shady company somewhere, they're not going to be checking for that. They're probably perfectly happy to have that business. And so there are easy ways out of, of that system, even though in theory, you're correct, you could track it all. All right, everybody, thank you for your attention.